there is also some uh, preconceived idea that we have to deal with, which is for many, many decades and century, people have always known, oh, senility, becoming old, it's normal to lose memories, normal to change and do things uh, that are not as, uh, you know, maybe acceptable <laughs> for a an adult. And, and this is a very strong misconception mm. that people still have. And so they feel that, you know, what do you expect? Uh, dad is 80 years old, he's on the couch, he doesn't remember all the grandchildren name, but there is nothing wrong with that. And they might only come to us when there is like a car accident or something very strange that occurred, like Uh, dad or mom got out in the middle of the night and was lost or many many there are, there are so many different risks and issues that can occur and and that's very sad because that means at that point that those individual could have been diagnosed five years prior and sure. they could have got help and and been able to prevent the quick deterioration that may be occurred. Welcome to the Exercise is Health podcast, where we're talking about exercise, health, and the interconnectedness of the two. We are your hosts, Charlie and Julie, and we will be coming to you every single week from our studio, Muscle Activation Schaumburg. Hey, welcome back, everybody, to the Exercise is Health podcast. We are your hosts, Charlie and Julie, and we are coming to you from our studio, Muscle Activation Schaumburg in Schaumburg, Illinois. Now, at Muscle Activation Schaumburg, we believe your health is your most valuable asset. Your health is one of the biggest influencers of the quality and quantity of time that you have. And while there are many aspects of health, our expertise is exercise. Exercise has been proven time and again to not only improve your health, but also increase your longevity and improve your quality of life. But we know that exercise is not the only piece of the puzzle, and that is why we are bringing you a rock star guest today, none other than Dr. Conchetta Forchetti. Dr. Conchetta Forchetti specializes in neurology and is part of Amita Health's extensive provider network, which includes more than 7,000 affiliated providers. Dr. Forchetti, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to our show. Thank you very much. And I think my children would totally disagree with your definition of me as a rock star. <laughs> uh, they, they think I'm pretty boring. Oh, no. Uh, I know nothing about hip-hop culture <laughs> <laughs> or any such a thing. So well, tell us more. than agree. Well, we, we would disagree with them because we want to learn more about you, more about your specialty in neurology sure. and how you got into medicine and how you got to where you are today. Yes. Well, Let's say my journey to medicine has been very well documented by my mother, mm. <laughs> who has preserved an essay that I wrote when I was seven years old. And in that essay, I states that when I wanna, when I grow up, I wanted to be a doctor because I wanted to help people. Mm. So she has kept that, <laughs> you know, written with the seven-year-old uh, handwriting. That's so funny. And then gave it back to me at my dissertation when I graduated. Awesome. So that, w that was pretty fun. But I think the major contribution to me developing such an early interest in medicine is the fact that my father was ill when I was very little. And so I came in contact with doctors and hospital very early, and it made a huge impression on me that there were people that knew so much that could uh, do things to your body that would help you to be better. And that made a huge, huge impression in my young brain. Mm. <laughs> so over the years, I changed my specialty multiple times. And then when I went finally to medical school, and the first thing that they teach you obviously is anatomy. Mm. And you go through anatomy and they start from the very most important thing, which is the brain. Mm -hmm. And so that, I have to say, was like a love at first sight. Mm. So studying the brain and realizing how that is was and still is so unknown and mysterious and how that basically control everything we do, again, made a huge impression on me and 
that that was it. So all the years I focused on brain, I did a PhD in neurophysiology, and then a postdoc in neuropharmacology, and I never looked back. And wow. That, that has been the story. And, and I have to say, through life and many life experiences, that love of the brain has never betrayed me. No, I, <laughs> it's yeah. never, you know, it's always uh, stayed there and has helped me nurture me as a person, as an individual. So it's been a very good relationship. Yeah. Very neat. I have to say, I didn't, in college, I thought I wanted to study neurobiology or neurophysiology. Yeah. And I actually ended up switching majors, as many students do, but it was very complex. And so, and, and as you just said, yeah. there's a lot that is still quite unknown about the brain. Yes. So it's very interesting, and I love your, your the curiosity that you seem to have yeah, on it. That, that's actually another feature that probably has helped me. Uh, I had an insatiable curiosity for things. My mom, still being my historian, she tells me how exhausting I was as a child, <sighs> always asking questions, why is this? Why this work this way? And I, I always had this incredible curiosity, and I still do. And, and that's why my kids tell me that I'm boring, because I'm always asking questions. <laughs> 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 Wanted to know why and how things are the way they are. So I think to be in those very difficult area, you really need that inner curiosity to want to know and, and learn more. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So tell us more about your practice today. Who is your typical patient and what is your specialty within neurology today? Sure. So obviously I started with general neurology and I did my residency at Thomas Jefferson University. and But I still can I, I did the three-year fellowship at the National Institute of Health in neuropharmacology. So that was my path to having a residency here in the United States. And then from there, I looked for an academic position that could allow me to do both, cultivate research and clinic at the same time. So I went to Rush University in 1988, and I stayed there for about 12 years. Mm. As I was a Rush, Dr. Fox was the founder of the Rush Alzheimer Institute. Mm. And as the clinic was expanding, he needed more physician, you know, more actual manual body uh, into the clinic. And I had done uh, work in degenerative diseases in, in my past. So he asked me if I wanted to join, and I accepted. And that was... Uh, actually a very good choice because uh, it allowed me to focus my effort not just in general neurology, which is wonderful, but extremely hard to do, and, and to focus it on just uh, brain degeneration and uh, chronic dis disorder. And because of my training in pharmacology, at that time, clinical trial were beginning in the late 80s. And that was a good opportunity. The first medication that now we have for Alzheimer's disease were being developed. Mm -hmm. And I had the fortune to participate into the development of those drugs. And then the Rush Alzheimer Clinic grew and other physicians came. And now it's a it's huge uh, uh, harbor for epidemiological research. Mm -hmm. But as things changed after Dr. Fox became uh, the chairman and he didn't leave but wasn't as involved, I wanted to cultivate more clinical trial and direct patient care. So the Alexian brother offered me the opportunity to start actually a new clinic. Nice. And that was, I believe, was in 1990. One that I started my contact with uh, Mark Fry, who's the CEO, and he we met and he told me about the brothers and how the brothers were all aging mm. and were becoming very concerned about the numerous problem that aging people encounter and how little particular care was devoted to the aging individual and especially the aging brain. 
so they had just started also a clinic that was called Older Adult, because you don't want to talk about old people. Sure. <laughs> so Older adult, adult, which was a general medicine clinic. And so they wanted to expand that to something more focused on the brain. Mm-hmm. So again, that, that was an opportunity of a lifetime yeah. because mm-hmm. I could uh, start the clinic with my training a rush, but also with my own idea and my own personal input and due to again my exposure to pharmacology very quickly we started getting clinical trial and we have been participating to some very very important clinical trial over the last uh, 16 to 20 years and actually we are considered in the uh, pharma industry one of the premier sites because we have the patients, mm-hmm. we have great team, we can produce very solid data, mm-hmm. and our retention is incredible. Wow, that's great. So we are fortunate that any major trial that comes in the country, we are able to get. Mm-hmm. So our patients, and going back, I was kind of diverging a little bit, the patient population that we have are the majority 60 and over. But we also have a lot of younger people from 40 over Mm. who are experiencing a memory problem for many different reasons. But the great majority is people 60 and over who are aging and are seeing changes. And the family wants to know, is this normal? Is this uh, the beginning of something that is going to progress so that we need to become educated about it. And then uh, what is that we can do? So th- those are the people that we see more often. And because of those demand that they have, we have not just neurologists, but we also have a nurse practitioner that help us handling some other issue that nurses are so much better (laughs) than doctor to handle. And then we also have a social worker in our team that helps us uh, exploring more in depth what issue the family is going through and how are the family dynamic playing, which are incredible. We, we We have incredible stories of family dynamic that can result when one member of the family is suffering with dementia. And so the social worker help us uh, educating the family and also helps the family finding resources Mm -hmm. and how they can better manage the disease. Because in degenerative diseases, we don't have yet cures. Mm -hmm. So we can help, we can educate, we don't cure it, but we can make the course of the disease so much more acceptable mm-hmm. to the patient and the family differently than if we were not looking for any help. Sure. So we are not just handing out medication, but we guide the family through the whole course of the disease mm-hmm. to the end. Wow. Mm-hmm. Hmm. So is that usually the first thing that someone might be experiencing for them to think, oh, maybe I should go in to see some specialty like you. Is that, because you mentioned the memory issues. Is that usually yeah. the first symptom? Most of the time, yes, is memory. And, uh, you know, without getting too much into scientific details, there are many different kind of memory that mm-hmm. we have. And, and the one that is particularly affected by aging is the short-term memory, what we call the working memory, the memory that holds information just for a while, so like you can do a calculation or something. But that also is what normally happens with age. And, you know, there are, this is a huge issue and maybe a very long conversation, what is normal and what is not, because this is what we deal most of the time. There are normal changes Mm -hmm. that occur as we age, uh, but there is also uh, not a a definitive line in the sand, you know, when when you are crossing Mm -hmm. over, okay? That's not 
a, a very determined and fine line. There is a spectrum. Mm-hmm. And so w- we have to be very careful uh, when we look at people, distinguishing between is this normal aging or is more than what we would expect for uh, the individual actual biological age. Sure. And uh, the evaluation that we do really focus on this main issue. There is also some uh, preconceived idea that we have to deal with, mm-hmm. which is for many, many decades and century, people have always known, oh, senility, becoming old, it's normal to lose memories, normal to change and do things that are not as, you know, maybe acceptable <laughs> for a an adult. And and this is a very strong misconception mm. that people still have. Uh, and so they feel that, you know, what do you expect? Uh, dad is 80 years old, he's on the couch, he doesn't remember all the grandchildren name, but there is nothing wrong with that. And they might only come to us when there is like a car accident or wow. something very strange that occurred, like dad or mom got out in the middle of the night and was lost, yeah. or many, many, there are, there are so many different sure. risks and yeah. issues that can occur. And, and that's very sad, because that means at that point that those individuals could have been diagnosed five years prior, and sure. they could have got help, and and being able to prevent the quick deterioration that may be occurred. Because even though we don't have a cure, but some of the treatment that are available and that we recommend can help delaying the deterioration. Sure. Sure. And so if dementia, for example, started age 80, and we can delay it for five, seven years, mm-hmm. people can live their that's lifespan yeah, that's really big. without encountering a rapid decline and ending up in a nursing home, sure. which is everybody's fear. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, doctor, let's take a step back and, and, sure. and define, like, what is dementia and what is Alzheimer's and are yeah. they one and the same or is Alzheimer's a form of dementia? Can, can we talk about yeah, that for a sure. second? That That is the number one question that we get. Again, there are misconception and misinformation out there. So the, the very simple way to define it is that every time you have a, a change in brain function from a previous level mm-hmm. and that change is permanent, Mm. not just, uh, you know, reversible. Mm -hmm. Let's say it's irreversible. That is dementia. Okay. Okay. So it's like saying, you know, heart failure, Mm -hmm. kidney failure. Sure. We don't say brain failure, which probably would be better for Mm. people. We use a Greek word Mm. that means no brain. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) wow. That's what dementia means. And, you know, anatomy is full of Greek-derived terms, But that causes confusion in people because they don't understand what does dementia mean. It means no brain. Mm -hmm. So it means changes. And so as you can assume, changes in brain function can have multiple causes. Strokes, head injury, infection, bleeds, hundreds. Mm -hmm. And there are many that are reversible. In fact, the one I always mention to people, try to also give them some good advice, is f- the most common form of reversible dementia is being drunk. Oh, <laughs> so oh. interesting. <laughs> where, is this where, a change which, in your brain function? Oh, absolutely. Interesting. <laughs> you don't walk straight. Sure. You don't remember anything. You are disinhibited. You mm. do things they wouldn't do right. if you weren't drunk. Sure. So. D- being drunk is the most common form of reversible dementia oh, okay. because once the alcohol is out, you wake up and say, oh, my God, I can't believe what, <laughs> what did I really do? Yeah. <laughs> really, I said that? Did I get married? You know, <laughs> things, things of that sort. But then there are many forms that are not reversible mm-hmm. where the dementia either is static, like, for example, after a stroke, mm-hmm. uh-huh. usually after a stroke, there is a period of recovery. Many brain cells, they were not completely injured, but just, you know, maybe pushed out because of the edema. They 
improve and usually six months to a year after a stroke that people can see uh, an improvement but there are always some sequela mm. that can be maybe easily recognized or they are subtle mm -hmm. so they can only be seen with a very accurate exam mm -hmm. but th that if there are very serious changes like loss of, of uh, speech or uh, inability to move an arm or whatever, uh, and loss of perception, so people cannot drive anymore or other thing. That's dementia, mm, okay. but and is a static dementia because unless there is another stroke, sure. things don't change. Mm -hmm. Sure, but we do see that after years. For example, very often we see patient that had a stroke maybe 10, 15 years before. And then when they get to be 80 or more, they start changing. Mm. And that can happen for many reasons, because maybe they have a surgery or something else going on. But the most common cause of dementia, the number one, which is unavoidable, is aging. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, just the aging process per se mm. is a risk factor. Mm. Uh -huh. Okay. And when we talk about dementia, there are many risk factors. It can be genetic, can be health-wise, like the metabolic syndrome, and can be injury to the brain due to brain surgery or other, I mean, lung surgery and anesthesia. So there are many risk factors that compound, mm -hmm. but aging is the number one. Okay. So now that we have defined dementia, and reversible and irreversible dementia. With aging, the most common form of irreversible dementia is Alzheimer. Mm -hmm. And that's why so many physicians erroneously use them interchangeably. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and that's why sometimes many people say, oh, does my mother has dementia or Alzheimer? You know, like dementia is not as bad as Alzheimer gotcha. is. Yeah. And, and so here I am spending a lot of time trying to reset mm -hmm. yeah. knowledge and expectation. Mm -hmm. So, but the thing is, what is Alzheimer? Mm -hmm. that, that's the other yeah. question. Yeah, exactly. And what we know right now is that Alzheimer's per se is the most common form of degenerative brain disorder, which is characterized by the neuropathological finding, which means an autopsy, mm -hmm. of two specific uh, abnormalities. And those are called plaque and tango. Mm. And plaque are deposit of a, a protein, actually a fragment mm -hmm. of a normal protein, and that's called the beta amyloid. Mm. And the plaque are in between the cells. Mm. So in the plaque, we can find all sorts of things, other mm. protein, we can find the minerals like aluminum or copper or iron. And, and that initially uh, produced so, ma so much misinformation, like don't use aluminum pans, mm. because if you use the pans with aluminum, then you get the plaque. Well, uh, that's because plaque is a precipitate, mm. it's something that drops in. Uh, with the protein, with the beta amyloid, and so many other factors are there, but the core of the plaque is the beta amyloid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the tangle, what the tangle is, is neurofilament, so like hair, strands mm. of hair, that wraps inside the cells or around the cells, and it's those filaments are made of again, fragment of another normal protein, which is called tau. Hmm. So those two protein have normal function in the brain. They, they need to be there, yeah. they have specific function. But somehow with the aging process for a genetic factor or other factor, which we don't know yet, mm -hmm. those protein become insoluble mm. and they precipitate and they cause a cascade of events that ultimately leads to brain cells death. 
Interesting. And that's the old thing. Okay. We develop Alzheimer, dementia, mm-hmm. because brain cells die out, mm-hmm. and so all those cellular network that are the basis of our function, mm-hmm. you know, like the chips in the computer, I- if those cells loses their place in the network, the network doesn't function, or initially, sometimes it functions, sometimes it doesn't. That's why it's so difficult to, to have that line in the sand, you know, sure. when is that yeah. you cross it. Right. And when enough cells die out mm-hmm. in a network, then the network is not functioning mm-hmm. anymore. Sure. And then, because we have so many different cells in the brain with different function, not all brain cells are affected in the same way at at the same time. Okay, okay. interesting. So the brain cells that are initially affected are the memory cells, Mm. but also frontal lobe cells, which are the one that are the basis of executive function. Mm -hmm. So decision making, problem solving, being able to follow a logic, Mm -hmm. being able to plan. And in fact, even though memory, the short term memory is usually the first things that people notice, study of normal aging have shown that actually the very first changes are with executive function. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. But because they come when people are usually retired, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you know, now that, so this is again connected with our society because now that people are working longer, I see so many people in their 70, mid 70, sometimes even 80 who are still working Mm -hmm. while, you know, 30, 40 years ago, they retired in their 60s. Right. So now, more often than before, we are seeing people who start having problem at work. Okay. But let's assume, you know, in general, that most people are retired by 65. Mm-hmm. So you don't see those changes because they're not working. Sure. They don't sure. need as much executive function to handle the routine life yeah. that they have been handling for a long time. Sure. And so the first sign are when they forget to pay a bill or Mm. they spend uh, an entire day looking for the wallet Mm. that they don't remember where they put it, you know, things of this sort. Mm -hmm. But studying aging population, we can see has, those are actually the very first change and then they are followed immediately by the short term memory. And then after many years, uh, they start also having problem with language, word Mm. finding, Mm. Mm. and then visual perception, and then ultimately becomes motor function. Okay. So that shows basically the hierarchy (laughs) in the brain Mm -hmm. and what goes out first and what stays, you know, for longer time. But basically the bottom line, the, the, the cause of everything is cells that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And destruction of those network and the ultimately the functions that those networks support. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that's so interesting because as you're describing kind of the process by which the brain gets affected with dementia and Alzheimer's and which area does the brain get affected, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, you're absolutely right that different areas of the brain, it, it hits it at different times because I, I'm thinking, yeah, when somebody has Alzheimer's, you don't necessarily see that physically they're they're moving differently yeah. or like they're uncoordinated or anything Not like that. Not for a long time. Right. Yeah. So the, the motor function standing makes sense that that's kind of like the last area to get hit. You notice all the, the recall stuff, like you're saying, the, the short-term memory, the yeah. executive function, all of that stuff way earlier than you notice the motor function. So that's really interesting. So it would seem that, hey, doing things to make sure that your brain cells stay healthy and, yep. and stay alive. And if there's anything we can do to kind of, you know, strengthen them, that, that would be a pretty good thing. Absolutely. And the, the research on aging has been very clear. So the jury's out <laughs> to help uh, preserving the brain as long as possible 
there are things that we can do. Mm -hmm. And the major, the one who have a major impact on brain health is exercise and socialization. And then obviously healthy diet, Mm -hmm. getting enough sleep, that's also very important. So all the sleep disorder will need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. But the the two most important factor is physical exercise and socialization. And what the studies have shown has been also very interesting, which is something that I'm sure sport physician and people like you who handle muscles know very well, which is that the exercise needs to be continuous and consistent. Mm -hmm. So you cannot exercise one day and then three days. You know that the benefit are lost after three days. Mm -hmm. So you have to exercise at least three consecutive days Mm -hmm. to maintain that benefit. So the study shows that people who exercise for at least five consecutive day for a minimum of half an hour Mm -hmm. a day, they gain a consistent benefit. And what what actually, it's very interesting, they even broke down the different exercise. Mm. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and what they found is that people that do only cardio, Mm -hmm. I mean, they're still benefiting, but they don't benefit as much as people who mix cardio with resistance. Awesome. And they found that, that especially upper body mm-hmm. exercise is much more conducive to the benefit. And then they pushed it even further. And they found that, that the upper body muscle makes special growth hormones. Oh. When, when you know they, you exercise and you broke down the muscle and mm-hmm. that's what causes the muscle to get stronger and bigger. Mm-hmm. Well, in that process of breaking down the muscle cells, there are humor factors that are released mm. that also seem to benefit to the brain more. Interesting. Wow. So, yeah, this, this is all very interesting huh. because it's showing how much we don't know yeah. about the relationship of different parts of our body. Yeah. And that's why I recommend my patients you know, when you exercise, mix, don't just do cardio or just weight. You have to mix the two. Yeah. And that's the best. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah, I love that. You know, there's a lot of talk out, I mean, in the media, and I don't know much about, you know, your specialty in terms of the science behind it. But I did know that, you know, resistance training was one way to prevent or make your brain more resilient. What about all the other stuff people talk about, like doing Sudoku every day or, Mm -hmm. you know, you hear that kind of stuff or like there'll be something coming out about like a piano, like learning how to play the piano is really good. What about those kind of things or is there limited research on that? No, no, there is research. Absolutely. And in fact, very early, many years ago, there was a study done uh, at Stanford where they use specific computer training to, let's say, rehabilitate memory and brain function. And they had many different group. And what they found is that people who were sitting half an hour, I don't remember now exactly how long in front of the computer doing these daily exercise did not show any benefit. Mm. While people who were doing physical exercise, who were just sitting Mm. talking with each other, they benefited more. Okay. And, and then they did other study using functional MRI where they found that what stimulates the brain the most is social context. Hmm. So certainly it's better to do Sudoku than just watch TV, sure. which is very passive. But you don't get the same full stimulation like if you were sitting playing cards with your friends or Mm. just having coffee and talking about politics, (laughs) (laughs) for example, which is very divisive right now. (laughs) So that that was more stimulating to the brain. Interesting. And and actually there were even studies that found that dancing it's a very good form of exercise Mm -hmm. because you move Mm but also you engage the brain because you have to move on a tune Mm -hmm. and you have to coordinate your body. Mm -hmm. 
So that's very complex form of exercise that yeah. is very stimulating. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, if somebody is already impaired, they would have great difficulty sure. to learn foxtrot, for right. example. Sure. Okay, but if you are young and vibrant, and you have to choose, okay, what can I do? I would suggest engage in whatever you like that includes physical exercise Mm -hmm. and socialization. Awesome, very neat. And you know, every people have their own preference. Sure, sure. (laughs) Sure. So is this one of the biggest factors that you see, you know, outside of the research when people are coming in to see you, you know, maybe they're 60, 60 plus, are the individuals that were limited in their exercise in their previous years, <coughs> or do you not really see that so much? Oh my God. The majority of people I see are so sedentary. Wow. That is sad. The past generation, I, I don't know why, because I didn't live in this country, but they were never really primed on the benefit of consistent exercise. Mm-hmm. And that's why there is actually so pervasive issue with the metabolic syndrome Mm -hmm. where people are obese they have diabetes hypertension high cholesterol because of the lack of exercise Mm -hmm. i think my generation the baby boomer are doing much better they are more uh, inclined to exercise Mm -hmm. i mean still there are people who are just not up to, (laughs) again, preference. But I see a very clear generational difference Mm -hmm. between like my mother, my parents' generation and my generation. So doctor, one thing that we've heard from a nutrition side of things when it comes to dementia and brain health is that something along more along the lines of like a ketogenic diet or a higher fat, lower carbohydrate diet seems to help with brain function, especially with those who have some kind of neurological disorder. Is there any evidence to suggest that that can help those who are starting to go down this degenerative path with with their brain function? Yes, I have encountered that question quite often recently. And just just let me make a a basic statement, okay? Nothing extreme Mm -hmm. is healthy. Mm -hmm. That's the basic statement. Now, Ketogenic diet has been used, and and I would say probably the only area where it's useful is in young children with an intractable seizure. Okay. Okay? In terms of adult, there have been studies, and and obviously there are companies that make products that substitute and uh, kind of induce the ketogenic diet who are promoting it. But there is no clear demonstrated benefit. And actually, in people who do the ketogenic diet for more than a certain amount of time, let's say a month or two, they can encounter kidney problems, kidney stone, and and many other body changes that are not quite healthy. So the ketogenic diet could be recommended to people who are obese and wanna like jumpstart their metabolism. Mm -hmm. So they could do that, but for a limited period of time. And only to help starting the process Mm -hmm. of losing weight, which Mm -hmm. we know it's very complicated Mm -hmm. and is more complicated than just a calorie in and calorie out. But I would not recommend uh, the ketogenic diet for a long period of time sure. in a demented patient. Sure. Yeah, You mentioned that a lot of your patients are very sedentary and that a, a huge way that we could potentially prevent dementia or early onset dementia would be to be active and be social. Yes. Is there a genetic component to dementia and or Alzheimer's? Yes, there is. And there are two very distinct genetic component. One is there are so far three genes that have been uh, found that determine dominant Alzheimer's disease. And when I say dominant, 
I don't want to go through the biology of gene, but means if you inherit that specific gene, mm. you have absolutely 100% chances of developing mm. the disease that the gene caused. Oh, wow. Yeah, there are diseases that are determined by single genes, and then there are diseases that are multifactorial, where many genes need to be present or play some role to determine. But those single gene determined disease, for example, one of the best known would be Huntington, Korea, mm. where finally the gene was found many years ago. And if you have the genes, and now we know specifically what the abnormality is in that gene, and so the more repeats you have of a certain coding triplet, the more severe the form of chorea is. And there are many diseases of that kind, like Duchenne muscular dystrophy, many cerebellar degeneration. There, there is a long list of single gene determined disease. Alzheimer also can be caused by single gene. Mm. And there are three genes that can cause it. In those cases, the family, there aren't many family, fortunately, and most of the family that carry the gene by now are well known. There is a huge court, I don't know if you have seen NOVA, or there were many articles written on this family extended kindred in Colombia, mm. where due to many generations of intermarriage and then migration from that particular valley to different parts of Colombia, how the, the, the genes were spread. Mm. And they're doing actually drug study on this kindred in Colombia. And this particular group is well documented that it's highly penetrant. So the, the people that inherit, they start to developing symptom by age 30. <gasps> And then wow. they are mostly dead by age 50. Wow. So that's what we call familiar Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And then there is another huge group, which is called the German Volga family, which I don't want to go into European history because if I start, I am <laughs> a history freak. So, But there was, in during the Prussian War, a group of German that were settled in Russia and then they stayed there, and then they were kicked out when Russia, the Prussians were defeated. So anyway, that family also has a gene, mm. and it's called the Volga, the German Volga family. But then there is another, there are other two genes, one other genes that is probably the most common mm. gene that is found in certain family, which are found everywhere. Mm. Probably every country has some of those family. That it's very important because knowing those genes, mm -hmm. knowing what those genes do, has helped tremendously in understanding Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. There are still many pieces of the puzzle that we do not know, mm -hmm. but the major pieces have been solved due to the studies of those genes. Mm -hmm. But then there are other group of genes that also represent a risk factor, but not for the early okay. form. Sure. Okay. They are a risk factor for the, what we call sporadic mm -hmm. form, mm -hmm. which is actually the most common form, but we call it sporadic because it's not genetic. Mm. But there are genes that confer a risk factor. And there are many that have been proposed but only one of them has been definitely demonstrated and uh, replicated and is well known, and that is the APOE gene, the code for the APOE protein. And this protein, you know, protein have many variation. So for each protein, there are different variation that we can inherit. Mm -hmm. And that's very important because that's what determines diversity. Otherwise, we would all be clone of each other. Sure, sure. <laughs> so for this particular protein, there are three variations. And they were named APOE 2, 3, and 4, just numbers. And they kind of function in, in different way in the body. 
And what this protein does mainly transports cholesterol and other fat in and out the cells. Mm -hmm. And fats are very important because they constitute the membrane and the scaffolding of our cells, especially in the brain, which is mainly made by fat. And uh, this protein seems to interact with the beta amyloid Mm -hmm. that I was mentioning. So people who have this variation are either protected or they have a higher risk. Oh, interesting. It can go either or. Yes. Interesting. So people who have the APOE2 are actually protected for Alzheimer's. Hmm. So oh, the best sweet. thing to have, because we have two allele, two copy of mm-hmm. each one, is APOE 2 and 3. That's huh. the best. That's the winner. But there are many. Okay. <laughs> there are many people that are so lucky. People who have two copy of the two, mm-hmm. they are also protected for Alzheimer, but they have a higher risk for cardiac disease. Hmm. Wow. So that's not good to have. Sure. Yeah. Okay then the majority of the people have three and the ma- great majority has three three mm. okay okay and they too have 15 percent higher risk to have it than people who have three two variation mm-hmm. the one that are the more at risk are the one who have one or two copies so the one who have one copy of the four, mm-hmm. they have 20 to 25% more chances of wow. having Alzheimer's. Wow. People who have two copy of the four, so four and four, mm-hmm. they have 30 to 35% more chances oh. wow. yeah, of developing wow. Alzheimer's. Mm. So if you have somebody who genetically carry the four, four mm-hmm. allele, mm-hmm. And he's obese, sedentary, has hypertension, diabetes, and all the rest. That person has much, much higher risk, total risk factor. So I think for general public health, it would be very important for somebody to know what is my genetic profile. Mm -hmm. Because if I am 30, 40, and I know I have a 4-4 APOE, and I know my risk, I can start exercising, I can start all those good healthy things, mm-hmm. I can avoid alcohol, drugs, I can sleep more, you know, do all those good things that can help the brain to stay healthy longer. Yeah. And so maybe, and we don't know yet, mm-hmm. but all the science would support it, if those people with higher risk would have a better general health, maybe they can delay the disease by five, 10 years, and that would be a huge, sure. huge help. Yeah, absolutely. So for some kind of family background on myself, both of my dad's parents had Alzheimer's. You know, looking at kind of family history in that regard, is that something to take in consideration when looking at, okay, well, what um, APOE expression yeah. might be might be happening? And, and if that's the case, and are we looking at, all right, you, you have to be exercising, you need to make sure that you're socializing and all, all the things we talked about? Yes. Well, the answer to your question has two facets, mm-hmm. okay? From the medical and scientific point of view, it would be tremendously useful mm-hmm. for you and other people in your situation to know what is my genotype. Mm-hmm. There are other facts, because you can start sure. all those changes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There are other factors to consider, which is, people ability to handle mm. information. True. So there are people that might be, uh, I don't know, affected so negatively, but that information mm. that they might want to consider suicide. Mm. If mm. they have seen, you know, a parent with early onset and had to help them through that course. So I would recommend before somebody does those tests, mm. to really look 
and maybe get even some psychological support if, if they don't know how to work it with themselves. Sure. Uh, what we call, you know, genetic counseling or just a health psychologist that, that can help working some uh, measure of being able to handle it, you know, some, some uh, uh, way to manage the information. Mm-hmm. Because... It's very easy now to find the answer. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. All you need to do is to go online, go to 23andMe, mm-hmm. and send in your saliva, and they will tell you sure. what your genetic profile is. Mm-hmm. So that is one thing. The next thing is, even though the, I think it was the American for Disability Act, say that is illegal to discriminate people based on their genetic make makeup. That I think it's only valid for federal mm. things. But I don't think employers that are not federal are bound to that. Gotcha. And what if that information becomes public? Sure. I mean if you do it Personally, on your computer, assuming that 23andMe, it's true to what they promise, that the information is protected and doesn't have identification, nobody would know. But we know nowadays how easy it is to hack information. Sure. So the, the privacy of the information is a big issue. Mm-hmm. And then already, for example, any young person of your age mm-hmm. that wants to buy long-term care insurance, mm-hmm. there is a clause there that will say, I was never tested and I'm not aware of having any genetic predisposition. Mm-hmm. So let's say you tested yourself mm-hmm. and it's private and you sign that you are not aware. Mm-hmm. That's fraud. Mm. Nobody might know, but it's fraud. Sure. So if ever comes up to be known, the insurance that you bought and you paid Mm -hmm. might not be bound to to the contract because it was fault from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Did I explain this correctly? Definitely. Yeah. So there are all those issues that are unsolved. Mm. But going back from the medical scientific point of view, I think it would be tremendously helpful for people to know mm-hmm. what their genotype yeah. is. Sure. Yeah. So one interesting thing about genes, and I mean, it's not an interesting, it just is. So you can't control what you've been given, exactly. right? But if you could give our listeners maybe two or three things that they can control, like a lifestyle habit or a thing to help prevent or delay the onset or you know deal with whatever they have going on, what would you recommend people do in their lifestyle to keep their brain as healthy as possible? Okay, so first I will answer your question because it's very easy, but then I also have to explain something, okay. if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, so the answer is control your habits. Control the portion the amount of food that you eat, the quality of food that you eat, exercise, get plenty of sleep, and cultivate a positive attitude. You know, try to have fun. Try to do things that give you joy and pleasure. Mm -hmm. And if you have a tendency to be pessimist, you know, try try to do things that will help not to be a pessimist. And so be social, cultivate good social contact with volunteering, seeing friends, family, it, all those things that can enrich you as a person. And then you you mentioned before learning the piano. Yeah, it, it was found that people who learn new things, they expand their brain reserve. Mm. Cool. So learn a new language, learn again, new thing, knitting playing, mm-hmm. music, whatever, according to people's time and obviously financial availability. Mm-hmm. But many things you can do new that don't cost anything. Sure. So learning new things, keeping the brain stimulated, and the exercise. So now the, the thing that, uh, let's add a little science to that, okay? okay. Sure, genes are very important in determining who we are. 
but they are not absolute. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what we are learning now, and, and there has been for century this uh, question of nature versus nurture, okay? This, this can fill an entire library. Sure. But we know now that there is what scientists now call epigenetic. And this is a totally new branch of medicine, I mean of science, that started after the genome was decoded. Because our genome is so huge, but only so little, it's made up of gene. Mm. So what is the rest? And for many years, they call it junk DNA, Mm. okay? Meaning it's not a gene, doesn't code for a protein, we don't know what it is, it's junk. Well, that junk, turn out to be extremely important (laughs) because that is what determine how active a gene is for how long and also the interaction between genes. And that junk interacts with the environment. Mm -hmm. So the environment determines or can, let's say, the, the environments activate the epigenetic factor that tells the gene, okay, do this now, stop now, or interact with that gene. So I think the answer to the century-old question, what's more important, the nature of nurture, it's totally inappropriate mm. because is the interaction of the two. So you can have, I'm just giving you a very simple example. You can have a child that has a a combination because those are more time multifactorial disease, but has genetic predisposition for mental problem, okay, mental disease. If you put that child in an environment that is deprived, highly punitive, abusive, that child will definitely express probably severe mental and behavioral problem. But a child with the same genetic component, and those are studies, I'm not saying this, those are studies that have been done in twins, Hmm. identical twin. If you put that child with the same genetic makeup, Hmm. like an identical twin, in a totally different environment that is very nurturing, loving, supportive, encouraging, that child might never develop mental illness. Wow. So they are equally important Mm -hmm. and there is not one that is more important than the other. They are both necessary and that gives us a lot of control. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to put that piece in answering your question because we are not totally what our gene are. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of power in influencing gene expression and by better lifestyle uh, we we can definitely determine if a disease or a genetic trait is going to be expressed or not wow so interesting very interesting. Well, doctor, thank you so much for sharing all that with us. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure. Absolutely. So, you know, if one of our listeners is hearing all this information and they're like, you know what, I need to get in contact with Dr. Forchetti and her staff and the people that she works with, how can people connect with you? Well, uh, they can go on Amita website mm-hmm. and look for uh, memory disorder or the memory disorder clinic and they will be directed to a number to call, Mm -hmm. and they can make an appointment. Perfect, perfect. And then the question that we like wrapping up with for all of our guests is, what is your definition of health? (laughs) Oh my goodness, that that is a very tricky question. (laughs) (laughs) Because that's so hard to say. I would say the definition of health, or a healthy individual, He's an individual who is living life at the fullest Mm. and has the mental and physical ability 
to live his or her life to the fullest. Yeah, that's right. that's amazing. That's amazing. And you know that that's something what you just articulated is what I would say one of the most consistent themes that we hear from all of our guests, regardless of their background and regardless yeah. of their experience, is this idea <laughs> that you know. And then obviously there's no right or wrong answer, but this idea that health is more than just your lab results. Health health is yeah. being able to do what you want to do when you want to do it mm-hmm. for as long as you want to do it. And, and yes. so that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, wonderful. So for our listeners, who do you know that needs to hear this information? Who do you know that needs to connect with Dr. Forchetti and her staff with Amita? Share this episode with them so they can find out this amazing information. And while you're online, if you wouldn't mind, head on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and review. It helps other people find our podcast, find the information that we are trying to spread. So if you found value in this interview, please, please, please let others know that you found value in it by leave us that rating and review. Well, thanks so much for tuning in. We always appreciate it. Have a fantastic week and we'll talk with you all next week. So to add to this podcast, we also wanted to bring on one of our good friends, Carrie Ann Ryan, who is a amazing advocate for Alzheimer's disease. And ever since we both met her, we know this about, about Carrie Ann. She's so passionate. So Carrie Ann, tell us first how you got so involved in being an advocate for Alzheimer's disease. I got involved in the Walk to End Alzheimer's about 10 years ago, and it was as a result of my grandmother's declining health with having the uh, the disease herself. I felt like I was losing control or had no control over her disease and in helping her since there is no cure for the disease. And this was one way that I felt I could take some control back. This among other things, I started a team and I started fundraising. And it's just, you know, that way of trying to take that control back. And I mean, your passion, it goes through all parts of your business, your personal life. Everyone that knows you knows that you're heavily involved. And aren't you like one of the top fundraising teams every year at The Walk? Yeah. Congratulations on that. That's really great. We know why you got involved. How did you start getting involved? Back in about 2009, I started forming my first team and I called it Team Lost Souls. It's still the same team, actually. And that was my first time walking. And really, I just kind of started out you know, attending the walk with a fundraising, you know, a couple of hundred dollars and not really a big deal. And since then, I have grown a pretty large team with some really heavy hitting fundraisers on the team that all share um, the same passion that I have for really just bringing awareness to this cause. Our, together, our team has raised well over $200,000 in the years that we've been walking and, and fundraising. And in addition to Being a team captain and fundraising personally myself, I also have chaired the local Northwest Suburban Walk to End Alzheimer's. This will be my fourth year chairing. So just staying committed as, you know, a volunteer in the walk and helping with all the different parts that go along with it. So we, as our listeners, we just got, you know, so much information from our guest about Alzheimer's. And now we have you that is already involved. How can other people, maybe our listeners, how could we get involved in, in whether promoting awareness of this disease or helping to fundraise for this disease? Tell us about that. Well, there are multiple ways you can get involved. Obviously, you can start as low a level as just being a volunteer at one of the events or the walk itself. Personally, I would love if anyone would get out there and fundraise themselves. So form your own team for the walk. And there's local walks all over the nation, not just the Northwest Suburban, just in Chicago, there's several. So form your own team, do your own personal fundraising. And obviously, you can always donate to me or my team. You can find our team has their own Facebook page. We do a lot of cool events, attending events and volunteering for those is even another option. So if you check out Facebook, our team name is Lost Souls. It's a Facebook page at Lost Souls. And you can see all those great events going on. You can also donate personally to act.alls.org forward slash go to forward slash Carrie Ann 2019. 
Great. And we will put that link in the show notes as well if you're interested in getting involved. Also, definitely follow them on Facebook, Team Lost Souls. I always go to their fun events. I know she always does a painting party that I love. I think a couple years ago there was like a a terrarium party. Really cool events that are all not only fun for the attendees, but also Carrie Ann always brings an educational component to it and it's benefiting Alzheimer's disease. So make sure you are checking out their Facebook and we hope that you get involved in helping to promote this awareness of this disease.